Hello and welcome to Series 3 of Greenbelt's Somewhere to Believe in podcast. In this series, a nun, a rabbi, a Muslim convert, a Lutheran firebrand, a humanist, an American liberation theologian, a retired Met police officer and an LGBTQ priest all walk into a bar. You know they always say don't talk about religion or politics. Well, funny that because that's what we like to talk about most at Greenbelt. Perhaps that makes us in for life. Find out and join us in this series of no holds barred conversations with extraordinary people who are prepared to wear their hearts on their rolled up sleeves, for whom faith isn't personal, who get stuck in because of what they believe. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Paul. It's hot. It's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> What's your flat like in the hot? Is it is it well well aired or does it get a bit stuffy? No, it's awful. It's really well insulated, which is brilliant. Um, but also it's on the first floor, so it gets all the heat from downstairs. So, yeah, it's awful. My fr- I keep inviting some friends over for dinner and every time I start cooking, they're like, I need to leave. <laughs> <laughs> this is unsafe for everybody. <laughs> This English weather is amazing, isn't it? Like we're now basking in this sort of mini heat wave that we've had and the temperatures are well up into the 20s and it it comes after months, weeks and months of it being pretty cold and dismal this year. So we're just not ready. We can't cope. It's amazing. You know, people joke all the time about how English people are obsessed with the weather and how we always have a complaint. And it's true, isn't it? It's like, it's cold. It's cold. Why isn't it hotter? Why isn't it hotter? Oh, it's too hot. (laughs) But what, what's a good thing to do when the hot weather takes hold, Catherine, is get away to the... I went to the beach. I went to, <gasps> on a day trip to the beach. Oh, now tell us particularly which uh, seaside destination did you go to? I went to Western Supermare, which I've never been to before, but it's one of my closest beaches. And I thought I'd just go and pay it a trip. I'm trying to, I'm trying to explore as much of the English countryside and English attractions that I can at the moment. And that was one of them. Well, being based in the sort of the West Country myself as well, Western Supermare is one of my nearest beaches as well. And I grew up going there with my grandparents and we always used to joke about it. It should be called Western Super Mud because the beach always felt like really muddy and there were donkeys and things like that. But how did you find it? I didn't think it was muddy at all. I thought it was beautiful. I saw a photograph and it looked not like the Western Supermare I remember. No, beautiful, clean, sandy, sunny, hot, lovely. You know, I don't, I've been to a few seaside towns and there's something really, there's obviously a history of them, which you have all these grand, beautiful buildings and these grand hotels and these big houses that seem like they haven't been cared for for a few years. It's like a faded glory, isn't there, to English seaside towns. They have the seafront hotels, mm. uh, you know, lovely architecture, big grand built buildings, piers, communal spaces, concert halls, all of these sorts of things. But they they all feel as if they're slightly from a bygone age or not very much loved or attended anymore. My friend said to me that, you know, his grandparents, when they were growing up, they would save up all their money all year and then they would take a trip to Western Supermare or they would tra- take a trip to Blackpool. And it was that kind of it was that kind of importance. It was that special occasion, which I think is, is a little bit lost. Yeah. And it's interesting to think, isn't it? Obviously, one of the things that the pandemic is really cutting in on is our ability and our opportunities to travel. And for so many people over the last few decades or since the Second World War, holidays have increasingly become to do with trips overseas, trips over abroad. And perhaps there's a sense in which we've lost sight of the fact that we're an island nation. We've got pretty good beaches everywhere you turn. Maybe it's a bit of a blessing. Maybe we should really focus in on what we've got here. That would be brilliant for the town's economy. It would be brilliant for local jobs. You know, it might help grow back the former glory of these beautiful seaside towns. Catherine, you ought to run for some form of political office on that agenda. I, I quite like that. You're seeing a silver lining in the cloud of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> There is, of course, another golden opportunity for Greenbelters to 
experience the beauty of the English countryside at the end of August because we're organising something where you don't have to go away, you don't have to go overseas, everyone is welcome and um, we're, we're, we're excited about it, aren't we? I think you're talking about Prospect Farm, our two camping events brought to you by Greenbelt Festival. I am, I am. And the weekend one is sold out now. We've got no more places on that, but we do still have some spaces and places on the midweek gatherings and, uh, and the midweek gathering. And we would love people to get their tickets and to come and join us. And you're working hard on, now that we know that we've got the demand there and that tickets are selling, you're working on the experience itself. Yeah, it's 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 getting really exciting. I've started to kind of approach some musicians and some bands and think about some fun stuff that we can do, like a sports day and conversations and talks. And it's it's getting me really excited. It feels like a little bit of magic. Just that chance to spend an extended period of time with our Greenbelt community chatting about stuff. I'm really excited to see what comes out of that because I think there might be some really interesting ideas for the future. Um, And I think that rather than this feeling like a second best option, we might look back on it and think, ah, it was really good that we did Prospect Farm because it gave us more time in a relaxed environment to just simply sort of be alongside and chat with the Greenbelt community, our angels, our volunteers, our audience and to sort of like regroup and develop a fresh vision for the future. So we have got tickets for the midweek Prospect Farm Gathering and uh, go, on our, go on to our website and um, read all about the events and get your tickets as soon as you can because they will go. Anyway, who are we talking to on our podcast this week, Catherine? We've got friend of the festival, Rabbi Herschel Gluck. Rabbi Herschel is a Orthodox rabbi uh, living and working in North London. He came to the festival two or three years ago, I think it was. And um, we sort of fell in love with the twinkle in his eye. (laughs) A very gentle soul. And we, it's fair to say, I think we had a a really lovely conversation with him. Yeah, really lovely. So, Rabbi Gluck, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Where are we speaking to you today? I'm in Stoke Newington in London, and this is my patch. I was born in Westminster, but my family home has always been in Stoke Newington. So even though I've traveled extensively, I've lived in France, I lived in North America, uh, but my anchor has always been here. Stoke Newington is lovely as well. Really nice part of London. It is now. It wasn't always seen as such, but today it's a very cool part of London. (laughs) It is very cool, yeah. (laughs) You uh, serve as a uh, a rabbi there. Um, What does, you know, a first beginner's question is, like, how do you, how do you become a rabbi and, and what does being a rabbi involve? It involves a lot of study. It involves a lot of commitment and it it involves a lot of love. One needs to study and one needs to be appointed as a rabbi. And then if one is lucky, one gets a congregation, which I was very fortunate to achieve, thanks God. It's 24-7 commitment. It means that one has to engage with people who see one within a certain context uh, constantly. One has to always be available. It's not a job, it's a lifetime commitment. And was it something that you always knew that you were going to um, become or take on? Was it something that you always wanted to to do? I I was brought up in a family with a very strong sense of duty, of... being there for others. So this was um, fed to me from my earliest youth that I have a responsibility, not just for myself, not just for those close to me, but for the community. 
what informed that sense of duty? Was it sort of like a, a family cultural upbringing way of being, <clears throat> or or was it informed from the sacred stories and the and the scriptures of your tradition, or or was it both? It's both because at the core of Judaism, the soul of Judaism, are our sacred scriptures, our sacred traditions, the written Torah and the Talmud, the oral Torah. And in the Torah, the idea of being there for others, of caring for others, for each and every person, in an equitable manner, is at the very root and foundation of our lives and of our lifestyle. When we look at the core people like Abraham, like Moses, like King David, they were at first shepherds. And God saw that they cared for each sheep in a particular manner, that they gave the appropriate nutrition for the old, for the young, for the middle-aged, and even cared for the sheep that ran away from the flock, and cared for that sheep as well. So therefore the idea of caring for all different people in a sensitive manner is at the very heart of Judaism and of Jewish practice. And I can imagine, I mean, I try to imagine, but, you know, sometimes um, even in my own small community, um, when you can be relied upon a lot or be called on a lot, it can be quite exhausting for you. Is it something like, what do you do in those moments? Is is there any time that you can take time away or do you go and think or pray or who do you talk to when if that becomes a bit too much? When I travel from place to place, uh, be it on by bus or by tube, I'm lucky I've never learned to drive. Uh, so I have time to study, to think, to reflect, and those are very precious moments. And I, and I think that the ability to combine both traveling and at the same time thinking and reflecting is a very great and valuable gift. How is being a rabbi and how is being being available for your congregation, for people more widely in your community, how has that been for you since the pandemic has changed all of our lives and we've been living in these lockdown conditions? What, what have been the main impacts for you? That there's a lot more work to be done uh, here in the UK. Uh, lo there's there's a much great emphasis on the local. Of course, with social media, one is still in touch with other uh, uh, parts of the world. But the emphasis has has swung much more to the local needs of people. I guess being a rabbi and having a congregation does mean that you have that local understanding and that local your roots are very deep within a particular community has that helped of course it always helps because um in order to understand the other one has to understand oneself if one doesn't know who one is it's impossible to know who the other is uh, and the same thing regarding community if one understands one's own community that gives a person a much better and a much deeper appreciation of other communities. Do you find that your community is, like within the church, there's been lots of conversations over the past few years about um, the congregations ageing and uh, shrinking, not being able to attract kind of the younger generations. Do you find those kind of problems with your congregation or is it still growing and prospering in that kind of regenerative way? I'm 62, uh, which isn't a very hoary old age. But in my community, I'm seen as, as someone from... Uh, 
a, a bygone age because most of the people are very young. The community is a young community. The community is young in age and young in spirit. <laughs> and, I, and I think that that is a great blessing that not only we are retaining the youth, but the youth feel that the community is theirs, that they have a investment, that they are a leading part of the community. That sounds really encouraging uh, to hear that. Um, what do you think? How do you think it is, Rabbi Gluck, that Judaism still manages to provide that um, attractive, that life-giving framework to people when seemingly the world has changed so much, and you know, technology, and the way that we live and that we relate has all changed so much, almost beyond all recognition, and yet you're saying that still the Jewish community. Uh, the communities here in the UK and London still feel youthful and alive. I think we need to have a real understanding of what modernity means. Modernity means an opportunity to use uh, technology to communicate. Whilst the eternal truths of Judaism, uh, as the name implies, are as youthful today as they were in the times of Moses and Abraham. That hasn't changed. What has changed is the means of communication. And those means of communication are a great blessing that we can utilize this God-given technology to communicate the message of Abraham, Moses, and all the great... Jewish leaders, inspirational figures, to people today who see this message as contemporary, as something that they can relate to, as something meaningful in their lives, as something that gives added value and meaning to their lives today. We, we read in an article, um, I think in a London newspaper, that, that you have coined a uh, a Jewish word for the, the Zoom fatigue that we're all feeling? Is that right? I wonder if you could I didn't say coin it, it so that we could hear it. I ah. certainly didn't coin it, but I love it. And I think <laughs> that it expresses something very real that we are experiencing today. And I presume you're referring to the word Oiskazumt, which means <laughs> yes. that you're, you're totally knackered from wall-to-wall -wall <laughs> Zoom meetings, which we all know what it feels like and what it's about. Yeah, I think everybody's feeling that. <laughs> <laughs> could you could you say the word again so that we can hear it again? Ois gesund. Ois ge gesund. It's a Yiddish, a new Yiddish word. Is it a word that other communities are allowed to use? Everyone can use it. It's no, there's no copyright on it. It's universal. <laughs> I think that's like the experience is universal. The word is universal. Do you find that um, kind of younger generations are approaching Judaism in the same way? Like we find that you know, I mean, obviously it's 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 different to each person, but some people can kind of modernize their Christianity. Or do you find that that's that's happening with some younger generations that are kind of experiencing Judaism? I think that, the, as, as mentioned before, the eternal truths of Judaism are classic, are able to speak and able to relate to every person in every situation, in every time, in every place, without exception. Of course, people are different. Every human being is different. That God created all human beings, but he created each one of us different. And that's why he created so many human beings, because each one of us has something unique and something special. 
And same thing in generations. Every generation is unique. Every generation has something which no generation since or later will have. And therefore, there is a certain emphasis, a certain issue that a particular generation puts special emphasis on, even though one takes the whole message and everything is important, but there is a point which is central, which is the driving force, which gives a special character and a special life force to one's whole life and one's whole experience. I think we read that your parents came to the UK um, fleeing the Holocaust in Europe. And is there a sense in which their generation, that generation of European Jews, those who survived, um, obviously that incredible experience that they suffered and lived through, did that shape not just their generation, but does that also shape your generation and and generations to come because of what happened? The Holocaust, of course, was a very unique experience which has had a very deep effect on the Jewish community. I think we still haven't grasped the effect that it had because it was such a traumatic and such a unique experience. Basically, after 2,000 years of Jews being in Europe, we were killed en masse. And basically, the whole of European society uh, was comfortable with this experience, or participated even in this experience. So therefore, it led to a re-evaluation of where Jews stand vis-à-vis European society. And I think we are still in the process of figuring that out. I am a proud European. I was born in Europe. I grew up in Europe. My parents and ancestors for thousands of years have lived in Europe. So therefore, Europe is precious to me. And I think that we have a special responsibility and a special privilege to participate in this rebuilding of Europe. I'm not speaking here in a political sense. I'm not speaking here in a European Union sense. I'm speaking here in a human sense. I'm speaking here in the experience of people as a society, which is beyond politics, that we need to reflect how comes we were all injured, either as victims or as perpetrators, in those years connected to the Holocaust, and how can we create a better future where such things are beyond the pale, not only that we're not cruel, not only that we don't kill others, not only that we don't persecute others, but we have a sense of love, a sense of commitment to the other, a sense of helping the other, a sense of assisting the other. I mean, what you're just saying there, it was absolutely beautiful and and it kind of, it reminded me how necessary that is in our society at the moment with everybody being so divided and so against each other and so to to kind of teach that lesson of looking after each other and loving each other is especially what we're in need of right now how do you how do you put that into practice how does that come out practically in your work that you do within the community when you ask me ask me the question I thought about the vaccine. What is a vaccine? A vaccine is we take a small amount of the disease 
and we put it into our system, into our bodies, and thereby we wake up the immune system that the future, that it shouldn't be affected negatively by the experience if we meet someone who is infected by the disease. I would say like there is a physical vaccine, I would say the whole COVID situation is like a spiritual vaccine. That we go through an experience like COVID in order to uh, awaken within us certain characteristics that have been dormant. And when we come out from this vaccine period, we have awakened within our human system various characteristics, various emotions, various good uh, actions, which previously were dormant or not as productive or not as 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 awake as previously and we start acting in a different changed manner similarly to the way a vaccine awakens within us certain abilities that were dormant previously that's a really interesting way of of seeing the situation I, i'm sure all of our hopes are in that direction for sure that covid in some way has stress tested us as individuals as a community as communities so that we are better able to more resilient to love to support to stand in solidarity with one another in the future that would certainly be our hope you you came to greenbelt festival a couple of years ago i think yes. it was for the first time how did you find the festival I, I found the people very open and very warm and very engaging and not shy. Uh, they were able to ask questions. They were able to have respect that they felt that they were able to uh, engage fully, express their prejudices, express their fears, express their uh questions and I was very very glad to have an opportunity to share with them my experiences and my views and my uh, Jewish values and beliefs in a way that was positive and constructive and I, I, I very much appreciated that. One of the things we really try and foster, and especially over the last few years, is this space where we can have deep and interesting interfaith conversations, where we can learn to understand other people's traditions and point of view. I'm not into interfaith, I'm into intercommunal. And that is that we all share a common space we all have interaction, and there are, all, there are areas where we can work together for the common good, for the benefit of the whole of society. And I think very often people forget what unites us. That, that's interesting, Rabbi Gluck, for you to say that you're not into faith. And that's, I think that's quite interesting and helpful because I think interfaith is a word that we very easily use as shorthand for something that no one really knows what it is or what it means or if it works. But from, from things that you said earlier in our conversation and then just now, it feels like what you're wanting to, people to do is to live deeply into their own traditions in a way that enables them to live more more loving lives um, rather than to you know interfaith is sometimes caricatured as the 
a sort of like the, the watered down um, least offensive or least problematic aspects of everybody's different faith traditions all lumped into one sort of soup um, and that doesn't really mean very much whereas uh, it's from listening to you talk it feels like you're deeply deeply committed to being uh, as deeply rooted into your Jewish tradition and your Jewish uh, spirituality and, and that is what makes you um, a better and a more um, you know participative human I guess am I right in thinking that you are percent right and of course in Judaism uh, we believe that one and only God created all human beings without exception that every single human being whoever he or she may be wherever they may be, whatever their background is, God has a special relationship with them because he created them. They wouldn't exist if he wouldn't want them to be. And since God cre cares for his creations, when he gave the Torah on Sinai, he gave a basic pattern a basic instruction for all human beings to keep the seven Noahide laws, to live a good and decent life for their own benefit and for the benefit of the whole of society. In other words, that God doesn't just care for our physical needs, but he also cares for our spiritual needs and for society to be loving and caring for each and every person. Going back to what we said, what you mentioned earlier about my parents coming over in the 1930s, they came over, of course, as refugees, as child refugees. My mother was 10 years old. She came over in the kinder transport that 10,000 Jewish children from Europe were given the opportunity to come and live in England. But of course she came on her own, with her siblings. Her parents and over 100 members of her family were murdered during the Holocaust. And she never got over it. That was something that she lived with constantly. My father came over also as a refugee, as a child refugee, as a 14-year-old. His parents were already here. Thanks, God. But he still lost a brother and still lost many members of his family during the Holocaust. So therefore, when we speak today about child refugees, this is something that has a long history. That many of us, our parents, our grandparents, were child refugees. And by coming here, not only their lives were saved, but they made a major contribution to British society. And I think that we often forget the potential that lies within children. In other words, there are two elements. There is the humanitarian element, which in my opinion is the most important, that if people find themselves in another part of the world in terrible conditions or conditions which make life difficult, that we have a moral duty to help them. But there's another element as well, and that is that the history of child refugees, that the vast majority of them have contributed way beyond what anyone imagined to the benefit of this country. And I think this is an important lesson for us to reflect upon. You know, even especially over the last 10, 15 years, there has been this narrative growing in our community in the UK, but in other countries as well, about closing your borders, about not giving those help to those people in need and even kind of viewing them with suspicion or anger. Um, so I think, I mean, what do you think of that? Have you seen that kind of growing over the last 10 or 15 years too? It's interesting. Though generally we think 
of 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 the poor of the destitute as taking something away from us but in reality the poor and the destitute give us the opportunity to be human they give us the ability to express human characteristics and human emotions and human potential which otherwise would be concealed in English the word for helping others is charity which comes from the etymological root of kindness in Hebrew the word for doing these type of actions is tzedakah tzedakah comes from the etymological root of tzedek meaning justice meaning correctness meaning being an exceptional human being a tzedek and when a person who's in need who requires help comes into your orbit you have the ability to express this spirit of justice the spirit of righteousness the spirit of what it is to be really human by helping that person hearing you um use uh, a hebrew word reminds me as we head towards the end of our conversation and our time with you um I guess in the Jewish calendar we are fast approaching the time of Passover. I, I wonder, as a, I'm, I'm assuming that you're very devoutly observant uh, in your role as rabbi and in your in your faith. I wonder, do you have a, f- a favourite festival or a favourite time of year? Uh, I mean, Pesach is a very very profound festival. It's the festival when festival of freedom the festival when we leave slavery and find freedom each one of us needs to find freedom because we are slaves we are slaves to our base characteristics we are slaves to what we are accustomed to we are slaves to our comfort passover we eat matzah Matzah represents the idea of humility, of modesty, of not being full of oneself, of arrogance, because arrogance is slavery. Arrogance doesn't allow you to see the other. It doesn't uh, doesn't enable one to contribute to society at large because you're so full of yourself that you can't go beyond yourself. The more humble a person is, the more humility that one has, it gives us the ability to see the beauty in others, in every single human being. Um, I think we've talked a lot about how at Greenbelt our faith really leads into our social activism and it sounds, and we've heard a lot about from you about that too. Um, we also have a real focus on art as a way of experiencing other people's stories, of a way of connecting to each other. Is Does art play a, a big role in your faith? Art shows us what other people are experiencing, what other people view, what other people see. And therefore, very often, art is something that we find inspirational, that helps us have a better understanding of society, our place in society, and how we can help other people who are going through unique challenges. We all know the scream from Munch, the great Norwegian artist. And I think when we look at it, we see our own scream, but we also realize that that scream is universal, that that scream is shared by others. And I think that is a, a work of art 
that speaks very much to our generation. Our generation has a primal scream. It, there's never been a generation where in the West there has been so much opportunity, but on the other hand there's a great desire for something which most people do not have uh, the, the words to express not only what they are looking for, they do not even have the words to know that they are looking. And therefore I think that painting for me expresses the human longing for a relationship with God. We shall never look at that painting in the same way again. We will remember your your words. Um, it's been wonderful to spend some time with you, Rabbi Gluck. Um, thank you so much um, for your time. And we... Thank you. My love to you all. Thank you very much. And my best wishes to each and every one of you who who is listening. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank, Thank you, you, you so much. much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So I've never had the chance before to talk to a real life rabbi. Have you? No, not not definitely not this much in depth. No, yeah, perhaps in passing. What did you what did you think? What did you learn? Did you enjoy it? Yes, he's so gentle and he's so lovely, isn't isn't he? And I thought that um, you know your initial question of what 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 do you need to be a rabbi? What is it like being a rabbi? And he said it's based on study, commitment, and a lot of love. In, in one sense, that doesn't feel complicated. That feels very straightforward. But in another sense, that's everything, isn't it? <laughs> I was going to say that that those three things are actually really difficult aren't they really when you think about it that kind of study wholehearted commitment to something and a lot of love considering that everything you're going to be relied upon you know have to talk about having to approach all of that with love is that's difficult you know how 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 do you work out sort of boundaries between me time and <laughs> work time. It did, it felt as if his whole life was an act of service and an act of love. And I thought, oh wow, how, how does that how does that work? That that almost seems a bit scary. Yeah, I thought that. And he, you know, he talked about the fact that he he has that time to himself when he's traveling or going on the underground. And I thought, well, still doesn't feel like enough. Like, how do you <laughs> how do you still maintain? you know, giving people the best advice, being able to approach everybody in, with love. That would take me a lot of downtime, I think, and a lot of reflection to keep doing that. So, yeah, incredible. You have to be an incredible person to take up that position, I think. What are the sort of things, Catherine, that you like to do in your life that you think give you that sort of energy and that inspiration to then go and do your work, to be with people, to, you know, struggle for a causes and justice and stuff what are the things that you need to do in your life to give you the energy to do that I think downtime I used to really struggle being on my own but now I find it really valuable and necessary to bring myself calm and to just kind of renew that energy um, but also to carry on engaging with people with people's stories conversation and also with art music theater you know if i see something that like that which really touches me in a way those stories that really touch me in a way that energizes me again it kind of makes me remember how to be human again <laughs> something which um the rabbi talks about and i remember talking a little bit about to Ben Kaplan about this is about the Torah and the Tal I don't know whether I'm going to pronounce this properly but the Talmud which is the oral Talmud, yeah. Torah yeah do you know much about the, the difference is it something to do with the fact that you know there's the written down scriptures that we have um, but then a lot of Jewish teaching and tradition is also formed through conversation through um, rabbis learning and speaking together is that is that what am i getting that right catherine 
I have no, I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea, Paul. But I just find it some. I find it really interesting that you know this idea that when things are written down, they can be taken differently, they can be twisted, they can have different interpretations, and just that that importance that's placed on the oral tradition of passing down stories and doing that communally and communally talking about it. I, that's something that struck me with Ben Kaplan's conversation, and it was interesting to see Rabbi Gluck picking up on that too i read something last week actually which is perhaps resonates with that a little bit catherine and that was you know when it comes to most areas of life science culture medicine we don't just look at something that was discovered or written 400 years ago and say that's it there it is and then live in the light of that or according to that forever and ever and ever it's constantly evolving and being challenged and developed. And, oh, no, actually, that doesn't work. This works instead. But often when it comes to religions, they look at something that was revealed or written down at a certain point in time and they freeze frame and they think that's it. Sometimes in religion uh, and when it comes to faith, we're encouraged to not tinker around too much oh don't interpret don't challenge don't question don't talk about it too much it's there take it or leave it but actually life isn't like that and human development all of our journeys the journeys of us all as humankind requires us to always be challenging reworking interpreting talking about and it feels like in the jewish tradition that's very very accepted and, and a part and parcel of of who the, who the Jews are and how they operate and what they do. So we learnt some Yiddish as well, didn't we? We got um, Rabbi Herschel to tell us about this, this uh, Yiddish word that they've coined, that the Jewish community have coined to talk about the Zoom fatigue that we're all feeling. <laughs> Oiskazunt. Oh, you've been practising. Do you reckon that's right? <laughs> I reckon that sounds... Always yeah, yeah, it sounds good. It's good. It sounds good. But but Yiddish, have you... Uh, since hearing that, uh, have you done any more reading or uh, finding out about what Yiddish actually is? Because I, again, I was really ignorant about... I'd heard the word, but I yeah. didn't really understand what it meant. I haven't, no. No, I mean, I don't fully understand it all i know is that it's um a language that was developed in jewish communities a long long time ago i'm talking about a thousand years or more ago in europe primarily in eastern europe and it was a means of taking traditional hebrew and mixing it with the languages of the countries within which jews were living all across europe and again i really like that because it's saying it's saying in a sense nothing is pure nothing is fixed in stone Life is sort of porous and messy and it's a mix of things and influences. And so let's develop a language and a way of talking that incorporates all of that. Um, and again, I, that quite appeals to me. The startling thing is I, I was reading some stats that before the Second World War, before the Holocaust, there were millions over 10 million yiddish speakers in the world and there are now uh, i don't know how you how the estimates are calculated but that those figures have just been absolutely decimated and now there are only a million or so people who are fluent yiddish speakers uh, around the world and i just it's a shocking little stat that emerges from the you know the devastating effects of the holocaust it was interesting when um, Rabbi Gluck was talking about how we we still haven't grasped the effects of that because it was such a, uh, a unique experience. I think he calls it. It was such a like a almost like a one off that we that we hadn't experienced it before. We didn't know where where it was going to what what kind of effects that would last with people and I, f I thought that was I've never thought about it like that it's not like it's done and dusted and over and we've moved on it, it's it's shadow is still very is long and cast is still cast over all of us and it it was so very European it was it happened so close to home in that sense you know to where we live and I also hadn't thought about it like this that 
European society was comfortable with that situation. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. How that must feel still now. And how also that he talked quite generously about how there is the victims, but how also the perpetrators were the victims of that as well. And it reminds me, I think, you know, we were talking about, I think we were talking to Clive Stafford Smith ages ago, and we were talking about some of the guards that work in Guantanamo Bay that are committing these kind of atrocities on some of the people that are held there and how it affects people's human spirit it affects people not the not only the people that are victims but the people that are having to do those things everybody's affected by it and yet through it all um rabbi herschel was saying how proudly european he was and you know he he definitely loves being european and living in europe and you know his ancestors have been here for hundreds of years um, he still felt generous and committed towards being a European, which I found really remarkable. I liked the way that um, Rabbi Gluck was talking about COVID um, being like a spiritual awakening for us. Is that something you can relate to? I think that was definitely in the early days of us having to behave and live very differently in response to this global pandemic. I felt there was a genuine and palpable sense that compassion was being really awakened in people. Um, I remember reading a piece in the New York Times, I can't remember who wrote it now, about a guy was sort of like trying to redefine the word apocalypse. And he was saying apocalypse isn't about some sort of like end times, huge destructive uh, ending of things. An apocalypse is about an unveiling of things, something that happens that's beyond your control that enables you to start seeing things as they really are. And I felt in that sense, spiritually, the pandemic was like a form of apocalypse. It, it presented us with the opportunity of seeing things that we hadn't seen before in a fresh light or in a more truthful light. And yeah, I, I can really see that. It feels like as it's gone on and on, that might have slightly waned and people might be really jaded now. But I think that opportunity, it could still be there. What do, what do you think about that? It's interesting because I, I kind of, it, that took me back to our first season of the podcast and how we were really focusing on how people find hope, like the positive stories that were coming out of the the terrible pandemic and you know how how things like black lives matter was really taking people's people really taking that to heart and that was growing across the world and yeah there was a real sense that things could change my hope would be like rabbi herschel's is that in some way the pandemic has awakened a fresh sort of sense of humanity and compassion in us that that will make a difference in the future i hope that I think it has. And I, but I think, it, again, it, you know, we won't know the effects of what this is going to have. For, this will keep on affecting us for years and years and years. And, you know, maybe we're not seeing those effects on a big scale. But I think personally, I've had a bit of an awakening by this pandemic because it's allowed me to stop, think, you know, look at the way that I was living my life and the things that I want to get rid of and the things that I want to change. So if I'm feeling like that, there must be some more people that are feeling like that. And if there's enough people feeling like that, then maybe things will change. We asked um, Rabbi Herschel whether or not he had like a favourite um, Jewish festival. And he talked a bit about Passover or Pesach, about the this idea of finding freedom. And that connects with the idea of, of being an, an awakening and, and stuff. I like I liked it when he was talking about finding freedom from slavery. Have you ever been to a Passover meal? Well, not an authentic pukka one with a Jewish community, but but what we used to do in our very Christian, devout evangelical youth group was at Easter, we would do these sort of faux passover meals where we would try and borrow from the passover tradition and sort of reenact it ourselves and i'm not sure how entirely appropriate that perhaps was looking back on it but no how about you 
I've been to one. I've celebrated it once with about 20 other people and there was two non-Jewish people and me and somebody else. And yeah, it was very joyous. It was very lovely. And I think that somebody was reading from a, a, a book, I guess it was a Passover story from a book that they used to be read as children or something. And and yeah, it was it was a nice experience. I love I love the way that he was um, Rabbi Gluck was talking about that we are we all need to find that freedom like that story is still relevant because we are he said we are slaves to our base characteristics to our comfort or to what we are accustomed accustomed to he's bang on isn't he <laughs> the, the the classical stories and truths of Judaism you know are rooted in particular narratives but but the lessons that we learn from those are universally applicable uh, for all time for all people in all places and yeah that notion of the fact that we all need to find freedom from the things that we are enslaved to or trapped by is just so true it's so relevant i think that that's i guess one of the the, the primal things that, that that religion at its best is about is about offering us a, a sense of true freedom that's something we don't think about enough i think like I'm really glad that he talked about that. It reminded me. It kind of awoke something in me that I think was quite important to hear. I like the. I liked it when you asked him about art um, towards the end of our conversation, and he referenced Edward Munch's uh, famous painting, The Scream, and he, he called it like. He said it was a primal scream. It was the scream of our of our generation. I thought it was quite powerful too. Yeah, our generation has a primal scream, and that we don't know, we don't we don't have the words to be able to really understand what that is, or how to get that across. Which is true. It's just talking about like this underlying feeling that things aren't quite right. For him, that boils down to everyone has this this need for God. That's how he clarifies that. But there is this sense in which he was saying that oftentimes most of us don't even have a language to name what it is. But we have this feeling that we need something, that something is lacking in our lives. Um, and his job, I guess, as a rabbi, as a faith leader, or lots of our guests in this series, what they're trying to do is put some language around that feeling that we have and offer that to people and say, is this helpful? Does this does this work? Does this does this give you a set of stories and ideas that that, you know, can liberate you? So that was a wonderful conversation with Rabbi Gluck. And if you want to check out more um, there's two recorded talks on our website, which we'll put in the podcast notes where Rabbi Herschel talks himself. And then he's also part of a panel where we chatted to a few of our Jewish uh, guests that year about the problem of anti-Semitism. How real was it? How prevalent was it? And um, it, that's a really helpful, um, good panel. And we'll put links to those in our in our podcast notes. <laughs> we got coming up next week Paul next week we are speaking to the wonderful Umpo uh, Tutu Van Firth who is as the middle name that I've just pronounced might give you a clue is the daughter of Archbishop Desmond Tutu who um, some of you might have heard of Early on in the Bowton years, um, we had the pleasure of having Umpo to the festival and a lot has happened in her life since then and it was a fantastic to catch up with her about where her faith journey has taken her over the last few years. We love hearing your comments and feedback on any of these episodes. And so there are a number of ways you can get in touch with us. You can email us at stbi at greenbelt.org.uk you can tweet us at at greenbelt or you can instagram us or facebook us at at greenbelt festival that is the first time i've got that right you absolutely nailed that Catherine. <laughs> only took a year <laughs> have you got that written down on the screen in front I of haven't, you that's... I haven't. <laughs>
Yeah. And if you want to um, get notifications about the podcast coming out and get a bit more in depth, um, some links and references and resources, we do a Friday email uh, that you can sign up to greenbelt.org.uk forward slash podcast. We'd like to say a few thank yous to the people who help us make these podcasts. Thank you to Daisy Wedgarrett on the staff team who helps us produce this podcast. And thank you to Paul Truman again on the staff team who helps us frame the episode. And to Josh and Jake on our Recorded Talks uh, volunteer team. They help us edit this whole thing and put it together, make it sound half decent. So thank you very much to them. And one big thank you to Lee Baines from Lee Baines and the Glory Fires for the use of his track, which we use in our titles. Um, it's called I Can Change. And we are forever grateful to Lee Baines and the Glory Fires for everything they do. Well, just sorry, I have to pause for a second. My buzz is just gone. No worries. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Don't worry. That's my HelloFresh food delivery. Oh, um, lovely. Mm -hmm. Lovely.